Okay, well, welcome to our uh, TDL 2012, the uh, beginning of our spring session. Uh, it's beautiful outside and it's beautiful inside. And we're going to have a, a great speech tonight from Jonathan Burke. Um, I'm not really going to get into any of the meat of what he's going to talk about. I'll just let him do that. But the, can you rem remind us of the title of the speech? Mm -hmm. Yep, the, the title of the speech is Corporate Conspiracy, Tobacco and Anthropogenic Global Warming. And this is mostly United States focused? Yeah, it, ha it has a, a global but perspective, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the relevant material is, uh, is centered on North America. So. Okay, all right. Thanks. So welcome, Jonathan. When it comes to persuasion, and in particular when it comes to discussing controversial issues over which people have strong views, I think we're all aware that perceptions of reality and perceptions of people who mediate their opinion of reality to us are far more influential than facts. For example, if you were going to listen to somebody who speak to you on the subject of the environment, you might have a particular preconception if they were standing in front of you wearing a lab coat. Whereas on the other hand, if they were standing in front of you with a nice big set of Celtic tattoos and a pair of nipple rings smoking an enormous bong, you would probably treat them as surprisingly authoritative on that subject. And I say that not to ridicule anyone, but simply because it's a fact. We naturally assume that, that somebody who has a certain awe about them, somebody who looks like they care about the environment, someone who looks like they're more related to the environment, someone who looks like they're associated with historic and traditional environmental movements, such as the hippie movement, all these visual clues give us, will naturally be more in tune somehow, better informed. Whereas the rather clinical looking laboratory scientist, the person with the lab coat, will suggest as well as somebody who is more further removed from the subject, who perhaps doesn't have the same personal interest in it, and maybe isn't very well informed, or who perhaps is informed in a different way, or who mediates their knowledge of that particular subject through an artificial lens, which actually distorts the reality. And on this particular subject, this idea of corporate conspiracy, that's a very important point, because it's our perceptions of the individuals who mediate to us information on this subject that has a very big impact on exactly what we believe. So, for example, tobacco on the one hand and anthropogenic global warming have been extremely influential topics in scientific and social discourse over the last hundred years and the debate has, has actually been raging for at least that long. What I'm going to do is first describe to you the history of the science behind AGW, anthropogenic global warming, and then the resistance movement, the corporate instituted resistance movement, which started comparatively late in the 20th century. After I've discussed that, I'll move on to a discussion of a kind of a mirror e effect where the tobacco lobby started a late, so I was actually a mid 20th century resistance to the science concerning the dangers of tobacco, and in particular cigarette smoking. So I'm going to start way back in the 19th century, as early as 1822, when the science of anthropogenic global warming started to be developed. It was actually all the way back in about 1922 that the science of what we call the greenhouse effect started to become established. There was a French physicist, Joseph Fourier, who whose uh, scientific principles actually became axioms in later scientific research, who discovered that the Earth's atmosphere could act as an insulator, increasing global temperature. At the time, he didn't have any working models, and his proposal was largely theoretical, but it was based on very sound principles of thermodynamic laws, which had already been worked out quite some time before. Subsequently, in 1859, an English physicist, John Tyndall, demonstrated through experiment that H2O, we know as water, and CO2, carbon dioxide, were indeed greenhouse gases that were capable of raising global temperature. And he demonstrated this through actual scientific experimentation on a small scale. So by as early as 1859, CO2 was identified as a number of greenhouse gases. It was understood that a higher level of concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere 
could in fact lead to an increase in global temperature. And it's interesting for people to, to note this. This, there was, this. this science was established without controversy as early as 1859. By 1896, a Swedish physicist and chemist, Svante Arrhenius, calculated that a 50% reduction of atmospheric CO2 would reduce European temperatures to ice age levels. And the reason why he was interested in temperature reduction, as opposed to what we're discussing typically today, which is temperature increase, is that he was not actually looking at the subject of anthropogenic global warming, which in his day did not actually exist. Rather, he was interested in trying to understand the science of the ice ages. In the early to mid 20th, uh, 19th century, the ice ages were becoming increasingly studied as an extension of the new findings in geology. And scientists were interested in trying to find out how the ice ages had occurred. How was it possible for so many layers of massive ice sheets to be, to be uh, laid down in such an apparently short space of time? And the only conclusion was that somehow the Earth's temperature must have been significantly lower then than it was later. And so men like Arrhenius were trying to understand how it was possible for the Earth's atmosphere to sustain such low temperatures. So he was actually looking at the, the issue from quite a different perspective than one we find now. But his research actually had uh, far-ranging implications and became developed as part of the growing science on what became known as anthropogenic global warming, or AGW. In 1896, another Swedish physicist who was actually a colleague of Arrhenius proved significantly that human activities were capable of increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide. And this was an absolute watershed scientific achievement. And he demonstrated through experimentation, in particular, that the Industrial Revolution's increase in coal burning was having a discernible effect on the increase in atmospheric CO2. Now, to us, this is, this is nothing new. This is well-established science by now. But in 1896, this was quite a remarkable achievement and indeed quite a, an interesting fact. Suddenly people realised that this industrial revolution was having global impact, which was, pretty, which was a, a topic which previously, has been, previously had not even been discussed in the scientific literature. And as a result of this research, Arrhenius predicted that doubling atmospheric CO2 would raise global temperatures by 5 to 6%. Now this was 1896. In 1896 we have the first prediction that a certain increase in atmospheric CO2 would lead to a certain increase in global temperatures. Not only that, it had already been linked to anthropoge anthropogenic global warming. It had already been established that human activity was capable of increasing CO2 levels. However, at that time, even the extensive coal burning activities of Europe and elsewhere in the world were considered to be so insignificant on a global scale that Arrhenius calculated that such global temperature increases would probably take thousands of years to come to pass. And so the science, although it was recognised without any controversy, wasn't particularly thought of as, as urgent, and, not, and a study of uh, a, 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 a something of a, a scientific curiosity, and interesting from the point of view of atmospheric study, but not in any way a danger to the economy or in fact to the global environment. However, in 1908, Arrhenius published a work in which he noted that there had been over the years a massive increase in coal burning as a result of the Industrial Revolution and especially the, re the result of the, uh, the coal and other fossil fuel industries expanding, especially not only through Europe but massively throughout um, the no North America and some of the other uh, Commonwealth countries uh, such as Canada and Australia, of course. And he now calculated that the rising atmospheric CO2 levels, which he identified as directly related to human activity, now meant that it was possible, theoretically possible, <coughs> that atmospheric CO2 levels could be raised significantly in not thousands of years anymore, but now mere centuries. And so now here we have, in as early as 1908, recognition that atmospheric CO2 levels were not only being increased by human activity, but could in fact be increased at a rate which is far significant, far more significant than had previously been calculated. By the 1930s, a US engineer, Guy Callender, 
started to observe definite increases in temperature in the US and the North Atlantic. And he identified this, building on the previous research, as the first clear evidence that human activity was having an influence, an influence on global temperatures. And again, at this time, the science was not even controversial. The scientific principles, the physical mechanisms had been well established in the literature. The chemistry, the physics was all understood. It was not even in dispute. However, Callender, like many other scientists of the day, considered that this increase would be minimal, that human activity was simply not on a scale which would produce a massive amount of temperature in increase. And some scientists even believed that this, this kind of increase, it was a couple of degrees or half a degree, could actually be beneficial. They were, they were speaking about crop yields increasing and milder temperatures for, uh, for areas which were otherwise, otherwise prevented from having good crop yields due to snap frosts and other um, atmospheric conditions which prevented good harvests. So throughout the 1930s and the 1950s, <clears throat> although CO2 and H2O were both identified and widely acknowledged as greenhouse gases, it was recognised that human activity, although it could lead to an increase in global temperatures, was not sufficient to raise global temperatures to a degree which would be dangerous or in any way harmful to either the economy or the environment or the agricultural industry. And in fact, it was generally considered that AGW would not be an issue for centuries to come. It was also considered that the massive number of other variables involved would make it very difficult to model accurately and predict the influence of human activity. All that started to change in the 1950s. As a result, largely of technology generated through the Second World War, a massive leap in computing power in particular suddenly made number crunching immensely possible on a massive scale to scientists. Now people could actually start to make re reasonable mathematical models on which accurate predictions could be made. And it was at this time that a number of scientists such as Gilbert Plaus, uh, Roger Revell and Bert Boland started to make predictions about the impact of anthropogenic global warming. And they said that these, and they made short range predictions. And this was the first time that the scientific community started to actively warn that AGW was a real threat, and it wasn't a threat for the centuries or for thousands of years, it would be a threat in the lifetime of people who were then living. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, there was a massive expansion in the study of AGW as a result of numerous independent studies coming to the same conclusions. Now, climatologists, meteorologists, physicists and geologists and biologists and even paleoanthropologists were combining their data and there was suddenly a network of converging data streams aiming at one particular conclusion that AGW was real, that it was discernible and that the previous models were starting to show some evidence of having been accurate. Now it was decided that the effects of AGW would be scientifically discernible by the year 2000. And the scientific community started to take on a certain measure of urgency in its discussion of this topic. In the 1980s and the 1990s, with a massive amount of data now available and another quantum leap ahead in computing power, previous computer models, which had been written a couple of decades earlier, started to demonstrate their accuracy. And in particular, ice core samples, I quote here from a, from a work, The Ice Chronicles, ice core samples turned the tide in the greenhouse gas controversy. The massive amount of data provided by ice core samples going back tens of thousands of years suddenly gave a new perspective. Of course, climate change had occurred in the past, but never on this scale and never within this incredibly short amount of time. And all of a sudden it was discernible that the 19th century and that industrial revolution boom directly correlated to an unprecedented spike in global temperature increase. And now, by now the scientific controversy over anthropogenic global warming was basically non-existent. It was well recognised that human activity was directly responsible for this unprecedented increase in global temperature rises and that this would continue to be an urgent problem. <clears throat> 
And it was around this time in the 1980s, only around this time, that serious denialism began to emerge. Now, I'd like you to remember that because the science of anthropogenic global warming had been well established before the 1930s. In fact, all of the necessary data to understand AGW had already been concluded and demonstrated and agreed to by the end of the 19th century. And it had gone without challenge throughout the 19th century and the first half of the, sec of the uh, 20th century. And those, the conclusions gathered from this data were not even challenged significantly until the 1980s. Certainly previously in the 1950s, there had been some doubt among scientists as to the extent of human activity in contributing to global warming. But the mechanism had never been disputed. Not only that, it was by the 1960s that the scientific community was overwhelmingly convinced that human activity was now creating an impact on global warming, which was not only significant, but would be eventually problematic. So it is massively significant that only when governments started to act in the 1980s was there an energy industry backlash, as now they saw regulation on the wall and their own financial position endangered. So from 1989 onwards, we suddenly start to see the rise of agitating denialist groups, significantly sponsored by industry, and most of them significantly sponsored not only by the oil industry, but by conservative political think tanks or libertarian economist groups who are aimed at opposing regulation. So what we have here on the one hand is approximately 160 years of established scientific data and models and theories which had stood the test of time, or predictions made decades before they were found to be correct, and the scientific conclusions and the data were not even seriously challenged until the 1980s. Now, it's significant also to note that the, a number of the key figures involved in this denialism of uh, anthropogenic global warming are also connected to the tobacco industry, and that's the second topic that I'll be discussing now. Throughout the 1950s, an increasing number of scientific and medical studies started converging on the conclusion that smoking cigarettes was harmful to health in a range of different ways. And in fact, the science of the, uh, the tobacco industry's own laboratory experiments also concluded that, science, that smoking was in fact harmful. Publicly, the tobacco industry started to respond in two ways. And they might appear contradictory, but the tobacco industry was covering its bases. On the one hand, they denied that the science was sufficiently well established to definitely conclude a link between, a causative link between tobacco smoking and damage to health. On the other hand, they also publicly announced their determination to create a safer cigarette. And as you can see, these two programs were a direct contradiction, and one of them could not last. And as most of us will be well aware now, the hunt for a safer cigarette died a very early death. The hunt for a safer cigarette died a death for two reasons. Firstly, the tobacco industry gradually realised that publicly led telling people we're looking for a safer cigarette meant that you're also telling people the ones you're smoking aren't very safe. Internally, the reason why it died is because the tobacco industry's own scientists and their own laboratory experiments as early as 1952 repeatedly kept on arriving at the same conclusion. You can't make a safer cigarette. And one of the reasons why this was is because the industry's own scientists gradually concluded that a key element in the cigarette was critical to its success nicotine. Once industry scientists had realised, one, that nicotine was addictive, and two, it was one of the significant uh, chemicals contributing to carcinogenic effect, they were in a bind. They knew on the one hand that nicotine was what kept people smoking, and they knew on the other hand that nicotine was one of the, one of the main reasons why cigarettes were dangerous. And the industry literature in a number of memos discussed this problem and concluded that that cigarettes were essentially a device for delivering nicotine 
and it was well recognised that they were addictive and also that they were carcinogenic. And I'm going to quote to you here from, from some of the industry's own internal memos and some of their own internal research. As early as 1952, internal, internal scientific research by tobacco company Brown and Williamson observed a carcinogenic hydrocarbon is partially isolated from tobacco leaf and smoke. That's 1952. 1952, the industry's own laboratory scientists were identifying carcinogenic car hydrocarbon in cigarettes. This was something that they would continue to deny for the next 40 years. In 1962, uh, a an internal report by British American Tobacco announced, we now possess a knowledge of nicotine which is far more extensive than exists in published scientific literature. And indeed, by the 1960s, the greatest amount of scientific knowledge on nicotine and in fact on the effects of cigarette smoking existed within the tobacco lobby. Nobody had poured more, poured more money into the subject and nobody knew more about all the different chemicals in a cigarette and all the individual effects than the tobacco industry. Predictably, of course, publicly they denied having any such knowledge and in fact they continued to deny that they were even working on such, uh, on, on such research. By the 1970s, tobacco companies internally well recognised the dangers of their products and they were also discussing the ethical implications of selling a product which, when used correctly, actually endangered people's health. As early as, um, as the 1960s, Brown and Williamson had internally concluded, moreover, nicotine is addictive. We are then in the business of selling nicotine, an addictive drug effective in the release of stress mechanisms. As late as 1995, Brown and Williamson would continue to deny that in public that nicotine was addictive. Industry memos in the 1970s say things like this. There has been no change in the scientific basis for the case against smoking. Generally, this has long ceased to be an area for scientific controversy. That's from a memo in 1978. Another memo in 1978 states, very few consumers are aware of the effects of nicotine, i.e. its addictive nature, and that nicotine is a poison. And all the same, at the same time, the industry had sponsored numerous groups whose sole purpose was to generate and manufacture doubt, not only in the mind of the scientific community, but also in the mind of their consumers. Internal memo memos also discussed the ethical implications of selling this product. A 1978 memo reads, the first issue is concerned with the ethical question, is it morally permissible to develop a safe method for administering a habit-forming drug when, in doing so, the number of addicts will increase? So, in fact, the ethical implications of selling an addictive drug which was known to harm people and would increase the number of people who were addicted to this harmful drug were also being discussed by the tobacco industry, and the general conclusion was, Yes, that's quite all right. At the same time, of course, the industry continued to deny in public not only that nicotine was, was uh, an addictive drug, not only that cigarettes were harmful, but they also continued to deny that they were doing any research. As late as 1980, internal memos said that the tobacco industry must maintain the, con the public statement, we within the industry are ignorant of any relationship between smoking and disease. Within our laboratories, no work has been conducted on biological systems. And in fact, they had the most advanced research on biological systems on the planet. Throughout the 1980s, the tobacco companies insisted on maintaining this line as a legal defence and noted with some pleasure that this afforded them a considerable defence against litigation. And throughout the 1980s, they were very successful in stonewalling. However, the scientific community was sufficiently diverse and sufficiently widespread throughout the world as to be uncontrollable by the tobacco industry. And it's worth noting this, the science could not be suppressed. Despite all the money the tobacco industry poured into their own laboratories, their own scientists kept on coming up with the grave facts. Not only that, but despite all the money that the tobacco industry had and all its public relations campaigns, they had no chance of suppressing the numerous independent researchers throughout the world who were all coming to the same conclusion from a range of different points of view. The epidemiological studies, the biological studies, the chemical studies, the pharmacological studies, and the psychological addiction studies. 
And this is something too important to note, that true scientific facts, because they are replicable, and because they are based on fact, and because they are demonstrable through experimentation, which can be repeated by anybody, are impossible to suppress globally. So, the actual science of tobacco had been well established in the 1950s, and it was around that same time that the tobacco industry started its denialist campaign. And the denialist campaign has in fact been significantly successful in keeping tobacco, the tobacco company out of the courts. What's important to realise is that uh, a number of the lobby groups and a number of the PR firms which have been involved in attempting to suppress the science of AGW, anthropogenic global warming, are exactly the same ones who are involved with the tobacco industries in maintaining their line against the dangers of nicotine and cigarette smoking. A number of them are also the same kind of companies who were involved in attempting to deny the science between, uh, behind acid rain and also secondhand smoke. Now, I've written this two-page summary of, of my talk, complete with footnotes and, and quotations and, and relevant source material. I'll be uploading this as a PDF later tonight to the Taiwan and Discussion and Learning Facebook forum, so you can all download it and have a look at the research. I've included there on both topics a couple of links and lists for uh, recommended reading. You can click on those links and uh, download the relevant ebooks or have a look at the relevant websites. And I'd like to now invite questions. Wow. <clears throat> Thanks, Jonathan.